What's up, gang? Uh, it's going to be helping Chief Schmidt uh, with one of the chapters uh, that he asked me to help out with so we can try to get uh, as many of these uploaded so you can start studying. Um, I'm going to do chapter 17 for him, technical rescue support and vehicle extrication operations. And that's going to start on page 807. The way that I'm going to do this is that I'm basically just going to be reading the uh, lesson plan, but I'm going to be adding stuff to that. So make sure you get your pencil, paper, whatever you need. I'll probably be stopping about every 30 minutes uh, so you can take a little break and I can take a little break. Uh, but hopefully we'll get through this fairly smoothly. Hope everybody's being safe, you know, social distance, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, really hoping by the end of the month maybe we can get back in and start doing some skills but that's not our call uh, but as soon as we can get in and start doing skills hopefully we've pretty much front loaded everything got all the lecture done so it's just going to be a lot of skills so get ready for that all right page 807 assistance at technical uh technical rescue incidents uh for you guys uh when you get turned out, they do have a medic unit at Station 3, and that is our main rescue station. They did start this past year at Station 4, which is going to be uh, considered a south side rescue, but the main hub is Station 3. The guys at Station 4, this is something new to them. Uh, they're still doing training. Uh, station 3, they have a lot of veterans there. Uh, some of you are going to get assigned to the medic unit at Station 3. And so you guys are going to be involved in working with them and doing some rescue operations, uh, extrication operations. So hopefully uh, somebody gets over there and gets some of this knowledge right here. <clears throat> all right, first of all, this is a Firefighter 2 section. So remember that this would be a Firefighter 2. A firefighter 2, and here's a key part, may assist with vehicle extrication operations and work with specialized technical rescue personnel. So assist is going to be a key word to uh, working on some of these rescue incidents. All right, assistance at technical rescue incidents. Assistance takes two forms, initial actions performed at any rescue scene and tasks related to a specific incident type. First responders to each of the scene must perform the following critical tasks. Size up the situation, Communicate information, stabilize the situation, stabilize the victim, establish scene security. So NFPA 1006 identifies types of rescue incidents. Confined space, trench, structural collapse, vehicle, surface water, swift, uh, swift water, surf, and dive. Also ice, wilderness. You can have cave, mine, and tunnel rescues, which are basically similar, very similar to a confined space and other specialties, which you can have animal, technical rescue, helicopter, watercraft tower. You may assist with any of these rescues as a sign. You should be familiar with each of them. So here's something that's key right here. Never attempt to perform rescue tasks for which you are not trained, qualified, or equipped. Remember that. Size up. You must size up the scene for any rescue. Ongoing evaluation of what has happened, what is happening, what is likely to happen, and what resources will be needed to resolve the situation. So in that size up, you need to know, basically under B, uh, one, two, three, and four, four of those that you're gonna need to know uh, for the size up. So make sure you look over that. All right, firefighter roles at technical rescue incidents. There's some other things you need to know to assist rescue. You must be able to know this, recognize hazards associated with the type of incident. Also, understand methods of mitigating associated hazards and recognize, locate, and sometimes operate rescue tools and equipment. Recognizing the emergency and hazards upon arrival, look for hazards that will affect victims or the rescue team. Uh, gather general information about the scene. That's going to be the incident location, the type of rescue, weather conditions, units dispatched, and number of victims. 
communicate this informa uh, information to your commanding officer and relay to other responding units. Assess, uh, access what is likely to occur if no action is taken and determine the priority of actions that should be taken. Determine whether additional resources are needed at the scene, such as heavy equipment to remove debris, aerial device to assess victims, and heavy-duty wrecker to move a vehicle. Stabilizing the situation. Preventing it from getting worse. So you need to understand that stabilizing the situation is going to involve diverting or blocking traffic, shutting off utilities, suppressing fires that can affect rescue operations, and incidents involving machinery that may require the equipment remain on until an expert determines that it is safe to shut it down. So those are some things you need to know. Establishing and maintaining scene security. One of these things uh, you can add to this when establishing and maintaining scene security, establish barriers. So if you want to add that, write in establish barriers. The incident command system requires that any scene have a well-maintained perimeter or barrier around the incident. That is to provide a controlled workspace, protect responders and bystanders from hazards, ensure the use of personal accountability system, ensure that victims are accounted for and protect evidence in the event of a suspicious incident, prevent further collapse of a structure or trench due to vehicle vibrations. So make sure that you uh, read over those and know those. The incident commander determines the outer perimeter, which may require marking. Stretch utility rope or barrier tape between any available objects, such as signs, trees, utility poles, parking meters. Leave a control opening near the command post. An accountability officer will monitor this entry point. Make sure you know that. Another opening may be necessary to provide access for ambulances and other emergency equipment. Okay, incident scenes is typically divided into three control zones. We need to know these three control zones, hot, warm, and cold. Their size and shape distance from the hazard depend on, and know this, wind, uh, weather conditions, topography, the amount of room that working personnel need, and the nature of the hazard. So let's get into what the hot zone is. A uh, hot zone, another word that you might hear for a hot zone could be an exclusion zone. Most critical area of the scene, know that, includes the site of the actual emergency. To limit crowds and confusion, only personnel directly involved in resolving the emergency are allowed within the hot zone. Make sure you know that. Know this, personnel must sign in to the personnel accountability system. Now, no, add this, this is also accountability system, is a control access. You're, you're able to control the access to the rescue scene. Control the access to the rescue scene. Where PPE designed for a specific hazard be trained to manage the situation. Warm zone. Know that it stands immediately, it is right outside the hot zone. Access is limited to personnel directly supporting work performed in the hot zone. Know that. All personnel must be in full PPE and ready to enter the hot zone. Know that. Uh, when we get into the hazmat, we're going to basically call the warm zone the decontamination area. The cold zone. It's furthers from the incident. Access is limited to emergency personnel. The outer boundary forms the crowd control line for the public. After the scene has been stabilized, the next priority is to provide basic patient care to accessible victims. Do not take on personal risk attempting to access a victim that requires the skills of a qualified technical rescue. Know that. Retrieving rescue tools and equipment. The cause of the specialized training required for most technical rescue situations, firefighter tube job will primarily be to assist the technical rescuers. All right, some other things you need to be able to do. 
You need to be able to know this, locate transporting and help uh, set up rescue tools and equipment. Some other things that you need to know that requires a firefighter two to know is where the tools and equipment are located on various apparatus, how to carry tools and equipment safely to the point of use, and in some instances know how to start or set up this equipment. So remember those. Rescue practice and goals. Rope rescue involves the use of life safety rope, harnesses, tripods, and accessories to access and remove victims. Make sure you understand that term of rope rescue. Firefighter 2 may be assigned to locate this equipment on an apparatus and take it to a technical rescuer. In general, rope rescue is divided into high angle, urban structural, or wilderness mountain rescue. The primary hazard, rescuers work without a safety net in the same environment as the victims. Confined space rescue, you need to know this. Occupational Safety and Health Administration defines confined space as, know this, large enough to enter, as limited means of entry and exit, and is not designed for continuous occupancy. Confined space in which firefighters must perform rescues, tanks, vessels, silos, storage bins, utility vaults, aqueducts, and any sort of cisterns or wells. Now, whenever you're doing any sort of rope rescue, confined space rescue, those sort of things, especially when we get into basically the rope rescue part of it, I want you to make sure that you know what type of harnesses that you might be using. So a class one, a class one harness, if you don't have this written down, make sure you have it. Class one harness would actually be a seat, sort of a, it'd just be a seat harness. A class two harness, let me back up, class one harness, seat harness, non-rescue, non-rescue. Class two harness, which is a seat harness for rescue, and a class three harness is a full body harness used for rescue. So two and three used for rescue, number one is not used for rescue, class one. Firefighters without confined space rescue training are limited to perform non-entry rescues. Know that, non-entry rescues. Support functions outside the space. Trained personnel can perform rescues inside the space, limited to operations within the scope of their specific qualifications. Atmospheric hazards, oxygen deficiency due to inadequate ventilation, flammable gases, toxic gases, extreme temperatures, explosive dust. Physical hazards. <clears throat> Limited means of entry and egress, tight constricted spaces, cave-ins or unstable support members, standing water or other liquids, and you can also find utility hazards, which could be gas, sewage, electricity. Some valuable sources of information. Uh, definitely pre-incident plans could be a valuable source of information. And so that should describe lighting, ventilation, communication at the scene, should have details relevant to protecting victims and rescuers. Knowledgeable people at the scene, plant or building supervisors may be able to tell you the number of victims, locations, potential hazards. Now let's go over some respiratory protection. Rescuers may not be able to wear an SCBA because of space limitations. So let's, let's talk about a supplied air respirator, a SAR. I'm not sure if you've gone over this before, but you definitely need to know what a supplied air respirator, also known as a SAR, is typically used, especially in extended rescue operations. Hoses, know this, hoses up to 300 feet long, connect rescuers' face pieces to an air cylinder or breathing air compressor outside the entrance. You may be assigned the task of setting up and monitoring the SAR system for the rescue personnel. Electrical equipment. You may be assigned, whether it's flashlights, portable fans, portable lights, radios, those are some things that you might be assigned to get, uh, maintain. 
Uh, but here's a key part to this. They must be intrinsically safe for the use in a flammable atmosphere. That means they will not create a spark. Also know this, that the backup team qualified for confined space operations must be standing by while rescuers work inside. Remember that. Trench rescue. A trench is defined as an excavation narrow in relation to its length made below the surface of the earth. Know that. And also know that a trench is deeper than it is wide. Excav excavations of 15 feet or narrow can be considered trenches. Teams must be skilled in shoring, stabilizing the trench walls. So here's a term that you need to know, shoring. Shoring is stabilizing a wall. It can be used in trenches, whether you're building rakers by shoring and you're stabilizing the walls, or it can also be used in uh, whenever you have building rescues where you think the walls aren't stable, you can shore those walls, but it actually means stabilizing. So here is the term that you need to know for shoring. Shoring is strengthening a wall to prevent further collapse. Strengthening a wall to prevent further collapse. Remember that term. When assisting, the firefighter will most likely be assigned to monitor the hazardous atmosphere, create a safe zone around the trench. Know this, vibration can cause a secondary cave-in. All bystanders, non-essential personnel, apparatus, and heavy equipment must be kept back from the trench lip. So make sure you remember that. We're going to need to know these safety guidelines. Trench rescue safety guidelines. Know this, do not enter the trench. Cordon off the area 100 feet in each direction. Also know, eliminate sources of vibration within 500 feet of the trench, such as an apparatus or heavy equipment. You must have an exit ladder no more than 50 feet apart with the initial ladder near the victim. Ladder should extend at least, know this, three feet above the top of the trench. Secure any exposed utilities. Be careful when handling tools. Dropped or mishandled tools can injure both rescuers and victims. Be aware of additional hazards such as underground wiring, water lines, toxic flammable gases. If the trench is contaminated or oxygen deficient, set up ventilation fans to allow the rescuer to continue working. <clears throat> Structural collapse rescue. Structural collapse may be caused by fire, weather, earthquakes, explosion, uh, it could just be by deteriorating of the structure itself. Know the first priority. The first priority, help untrap victims to a safe area. So your first priority is, you, especially if you have ambulatory untrapped victims, is you move them first and get them out of the way. Next priority is extricate victims who are trapped by collapsed debris. So that would be your next priority. After these victims are taken care of, technical rescue teams attempt to rescue victims trapped deep, uh, deep beneath the rubble. To assist the rescue teams, you must be able to recognize different collapse patterns. Structural collapse and predictable patterns allow accurate prediction of location of trapped victims. All right, so on page 813, five patterns of structural collapse. You will need to know all five patterns. I'll go over them briefly. Pancake collapse can occur when the exterior walls collapse simultaneously, causing the roof and upper floors to collapse on top of each other. Least likely pattern to contain a void, which live victims may be found. V-shaped pattern occurs when the outer walls remain intact and the upper floors or the roof structure fail in the middle. This offers a good chance for a space that could be created along the outer walls in any space that maybe a void space is definitely a place that you may have survivable victims. Lean-to collapse occurs when the outer wall fails while the opposite wall remains intact. That can form a triangular void in which victims are likely to uh, survive. An A-frame collapse occurs when the floor and or roof assemblies on both sides of the load bearing center wall collapse. Victims have a good chance of surviving with the void spaces on both sides of that wall. Cantilever collapse. This occurs when one or more walls of a multi-story, that's a key part, multi-story building collapse, leaving the floors attached 
two and supported by the remaining walls. That's another place you have a good chance of habitable voids. But you also need to know that for a cantilever, that that is the most vulnerable to a secondary collapse. So make sure you know that. Physical hazards, debris that is sharp, jagged, or unstable, exposed wiring, broken glass, confined spaces, unprotected openings, secondary collapse, environmental collapse, or environmental hazards, fire, noise, darkness, temperature extremes. <clears throat> okay, I got about 10 more minutes left before I take a little break. We're going to do vehicle rescue. Vehicle rescue, let's see, depending on the local policy and procedures, vehicle extrication may be assigned to a technical rescue team or to an engine or truck company trained and equipped to perform this type of task. If the firefighter is not a member of a unit trained to perform vehicle, vehicle extrication, he or she will assist the rescue team members in, know this, setting up equipment, providing care to victims, standing by with a charged hose line, any kind of vehicle uh, rescue extrication work you're going to do. A charged hose line will be on the ground. And here's another big one, providing a security barrier. One of your skills that you're going to be doing, hopefully when we get back, and this is one that has been on the state test that I've noticed, is uh, basically uh, you have to be, uh, uh, set up a barrier, hose line down, and identify the scene that you're going to be working around. So that's one of the skills we'll be going over when we get back. Wear correct PPE when working near the damaged vehicle, which is going to be full PPE, probably minus an SEBA. And here's a big one right here. Always wear approved retro-reflective vest if you are not engaged in fire suppression or extrication. Make sure you have that down. Water and ice rescue. Water and ice rescue operations include the following conditions. Ice, surface, dive, swift water, surf. Locations where water rescue may be required, swimming pool, ponds, lakes, rivers, streams, shoreline, swamps, so forth and so on. All right, let's need to know this. First task during size up, determine whether the incident requires a rescue or recovery. Make sure you know that. A rescue is a victim may be saved. A recovery, the victim has been submerged for a long period of time and has died. The main goal is to recover a body. So when we get back, we go back to risk versus benefits. We will take a greater risk for a rescue. We will not take any risk for a recovery. All right, so water rescue. I'm gonna give you something real quick. And it's just a saying, reach. Oh, I kind of messed up, it messed up on me a little bit. Anyway, uh, real quick. Uh, water rescue, uh, there's a saying you need to write down, reach, throw, row, and go. So, first part, water rescue, reach, see if you can reach out and grab them. The second part, throw, if you have a rope or some sort of floating device, throw that. Row, if you have a boat, kayak, something of that nature, you can go out and try to get them in that vessel. And then the last part would be go, and that would be you swimming out there to get them. So reach, throw, row, and go. Personal flotation devices, PFDs, life jackets, vests, and other devices that provide buoyancy to the wearer. Know this, mandatory, mandatory for all personnel entering the water, working within 10 feet of the water's edge, know that. <clears throat> or riding on a waterborne craft, must be U.S. Coast Guard approved, Firefighters assisting the rescue team may wear structural PPE for warmth. They should not approach the water's edge. Structural PPE can quickly become waterlogged and pull you under. So if you have on full PPE, make sure you do not get close to the water's edge. Hazards that you should describe in the situation report. Undercurrents, unstable or slippery soil, debris, sinkholes, quicksand, sharp rocks, extreme temperatures. Ice rescues. Ice rescues. Additional hazards such as thin and unpredictable ice. 
Just because ice appears thick does not mean it's strong. If, the, if there is a victim in the water, it is safe to assume that the ice is weak. Victims are unlikely to uh, be able to help with their own rescue. Their hands are extremely cold and possibly frozen. Heavy, wet clothing can make it difficult to keep their heads above water. A victim will almost certainly be suffering from hypothermia. Critical to have an advanced life support unit on scene. Immersion in ice water causes the body's core temperature to drop. Rescuers must remove the victim quickly to increase their chance of survival. Low head or low water dams. Extremely dangerous for victims and rescuers. These dams create a pool of standing water in a river or stream. Water creates an undertow as it passes over the face of the dam, creating powerful undercurrents. We need to know that. This is also need to know. It is commonly called the drowning machine. The hydraulic action of this dam is virtually impossible to escape. Rolling motion of the water flowing over the dam causes a strong current to return to the point of the downwash. An object can be pulled into the downwash, pushed to the bottom, and pulled to the surface by the same current and taken back into the downwash. The cycle can continue indefinitely. Victims caught in this cycle will be continually submerged until they are rescued, break free, or drown. Also, the debris trapped against the upside face of the dam, that's going to also pose additional hazards. So definitely make sure you go over low head dams and what kind of hazards that they cause and what an under undercurrent is. Okay, I'm going to do, we're at 27 minutes. Okay, cave, mine, and tunnel rescue operations require specialized rescue training and equipment similar to that required for confined space operations. We need to know that a firefighter too should be prepared to monitor communication channels and search lines, operate a SAR, assist victims once they have been removed from the hot zone. Okay, hazards can include caves, toxic gases, oxygen deficiency, sharp rocks, lack of available light. It also could be mines, toxic gases, oxygen deficiency, uh, explosive atmosp uh, atmospheres, tunnels, toxic gases, smoke, fire, tangled debris, lack of available light, could also have biological waste and sewers. Now I'm going to add something to cave mine and tunnel rescue operations. And you could also use this for confined space. They're basically the same. It's called OATH, O-A-T-H. You need to know this. OATH stands for, and this is going to be a rope. If they, you've got a rope on personnel, and as they go in on this search rope, what they're going to do, if they tug once, it could mean OK. If they tug twice, that means advance. If they tug three times, that means take up slack. And if they tug four times, that means help. And that is the oath standard. So make sure you remember that and you know that. Machinery rescues. That's going to involve victims caught between parts of a machine. Types of injuries that result make these incidents extremely stressful. Uh, could occur at any of these places. I'm not going to name them all. Machine shops, manufacturing facilities, lumber mills, shipyards, rail yards, any of those type of places. Uh, when sizing up the situation, you need to know the victim's medical condition and degree of entrapment. What type of machinery, number of rescue personnel needed, extrication equipment needed, uh, scene safety issues, precautions necessary before securing the power to the machinery. So you need to know this. Stabilize the machinery with cribbing, chains, or heavy-duty nylon webbing, then shut off its power. Make sure you know that. And here's a key part here. You definitely need to know this. Use a lockout tagout device to, to secure the power switches. 
This lockout tagout could be an actual rule padlock you can put on uh, a breaker and lock it out. And basically, you could also use a red tag, like a tagout, something that uh, you can wrap around the breaker once it's turned off that says do not turn on. So lockout tagout. Rescuers may need outside expertise. Plant personnel who use the machinery are usually good sources of information. You might need an off-site expert that might be required. Off-site experts should be identified in the department's pre-incident plan. So, key part to that. Lock out, tag out, stabilize the machinery, cribbing, chains, heavy-duty equipment, and also make sure you turn off the power to the machinery involved. Okay, break time. I'm going to save this and we'll be back in a little bit.